some different people in the book of Acts and just one of those studies that I was doing, and I thought it would be kind of cool to do that. And God kind of led us down that road just to kind of re-emphasize looking at our own salvation and, and how we were saved and, you know, and to, uh, to give us the, the assurance of our own salvation and to see what was uh, preached. Uh, I guess because I'm a preacher, I love to see what Paul and some of those pr- uh, preachers preached during that time and, and what was being said uh, that led people to... Uh, to salvation, and so we've been doing that, and I want to I want to continue to do that tonight. I don't know how much longer we'll do this, but uh, tonight I want to look at the, uh, the the conversion of the Philippian jailer, and, and this is a, a great great testimony of the power of God and and how God works. And uh, you, you know, when we think about this, just uh, uh, again what was preached and what was said in the circumstances, that's kind of what I'm going to look at tonight. I, I begin each one of those at looking at. What was taking place? What uh, precipitated uh, all of this uh, this happening? What was going on? Kind of giving you the background of what was going on. And then uh, the sermon that was preached and what was said and, and what took place uh, uh, during that time. So no different tonight. We'll be in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And I want to read verses 25 through verse 34. Again, we're going to talk about the conversion of the jailer. And here's another one of those. And by the way, let me just say this. That out of this... Out of, you know, we look at Lydia uh, and her household, and then we're going to look at tonight at uh, the Philippian jailer. Out of this, the church at Philippi uh, was, was birthed. Uh, and so this is the beginning of that church uh, at Philippi. And so it, it is a, it's great information to look at. And uh, Again, this is one of those that talks about and the whole household. And, I, and I'm going to share again tonight that a lot of people will use that phrase and household to back up baby baptism. And that's not what the Bible says, uh, but those that, that believe in that will use that, that phrase there. Uh, and so, uh, guys, you rise to your feet as we pay tribute to the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 16, we'll begin in verse 25 and go through verse 34. This is what the Bible says. It says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. I like that. Uh, now, a lot of times we just think about that it was it was just you know it was Paul and Silas, but there were other prisoners that were there, and Paul and Silas were singing and praising God. And what, at one time, about midnight, uh, they having a church service late, wasn't it? Uh, it's hard to get people here during the daytime. I can't imagine trying to have church. At, I, I, I guess what we need to do is lock people up, and then we can have church at midnight, right? Uh, and, and notice what it said. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the, the very foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all, look at that, all the doors were open. I think we miss that sometimes. All the doors were open. And everyone, that means every prisoner in there, bonds or bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakened out of his sleep. I'm sure the earthquake woke him up, right? And the twanging of the chains and the opening of the doors. Waking from his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself. You know why? Because he knew he was in trouble. When he, when he saw the prison doors open, his only job was to make sure the prisoners stayed secure. And, and that didn't happen, right? When, or when he saw the doors open, he thought all the prisoners had escaped. And so he knew his life was over at that point. So he was willing to take his own life. Okay, I just want you to see that. He drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and he sprang in, and he came trembling, and he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he had a great question. And he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? That's a simple question, isn't it? Here is the simple answer. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and he washed their stripes, and was baptized he and all his Straightway. 
And when he had brought them into the house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Will you bow with me? Father, we come tonight. God, what a, what a wonderful question for the world to ask. And as we've been studying this study, dear Heavenly Father, we've seen that those that are religious are great prospects. Those that are seeking will find. Those, dear Heavenly Father, that want to know to, to gain knowledge and wisdom, God, it is found in you. Tonight, as we share, we pray that our preaching would be anointed by the Spirit, that God, it would fall on the ears tonight that need to hear, and that it would settle on the hearts that it needs to settle. The hearts that need to be changed. And so Father we pray tonight. As we share in this time. That God you would use these words. To answer the question. What must I do. To be saved. Just be with us. Watch over. Keep us. Forgive us where we fail you so many times. For we ask it in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we've done each Sunday night, we've began by sharing the basis of, of, of the story of what was taking place. So tonight is no different. I want to look at the conversion of the, of the, of the Philippian jailer and his household and, and, and the events that led up to that. Because sometimes, here's what I want you to know, sometimes God is working behind the scene. God is working in the events uh, in order to create the opportunity for the word to be shared. You know, it's kind of like this, and I... I, I like to share this with young people, and I'll share it with you that are here. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact that there is a trinity, that God, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I, I share with you that that is the greatest example of love. Matter of fact, you know, I've, I've said this, the only way that love is true love is love has to be shared. Love is absolutely no good if it isn't shared. It means nothing. Love not shared means nothing. It's kind of like intentions. You can have good intentions, but if intentions are not followed through, they're not worth anything. Good intentions mean nothing, okay? Uh, and, and so, if, if we can think about a triangle, and that's, you know, three points. Triangle has a three points. And so, uh, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of them are connected together. All of them are together, okay? And so, love, uh, the fact that it, 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 there is a trinity, and love was shared before you and I was ever created. Uh, because there's a trinity love, there's love that is tied to all three of those if you think about a triangle, okay? And so the Father and the, the, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now listen, the Father is tied to the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit tied to the Father, and to the Son, and the Son, to the Father, and to the Holy Spirit. So you think about it that way. Well, not only that, but I want, I want you to think about this too, and this is kind of in Paul's life, and when we look at each other, how, how the Bible tells us we are to love one another, if we put God at the top of the triangle, let's do it with our spouses, if we put God at the top of the triangle and then we put a husband and we put a wife on each corner, we're still all three tied together, okay? But here's the thing that's really cool. Here's the thing that's really cool in relationships, all right? If you take a triangle, and I wish I would have drawn this out and had it on the screen. If you take a triangle and you got God at the top and you got your relationships at the bottom, if you begin to move up the triangle and you begin to move closer to God, guess what happens to the relationship down here? As you begin to move up that triangle, the closer you get to God, the closer you get to each other. And that's really what a covenant marriage is all about. That's what relationship is all about. So that when we move closer to God, we move up that triangle, and it is actually bringing us closer together as we get closer to God. And that's kind of what Paul understood in relationship that we have with people. It's one of the reasons why Paul used the opportunity to preach to the Philippian jailer, and he didn't run away. He didn't run away that night because he understands that the relationship with God is really what binds us together. It's what draws us close together as humanity, as people. And so notice this, what happens. Now, in, in setting the stage of this, I want you to see, and we, I don't know, we may go back and read this, I don't know, but well, let's go back and look at, at, at verse 16. Back up to verse 16 uh, of the same chapter. and let's set the, let's set the stage of what's going on. How did Paul and Silas end up in prison? Okay. You're going to see some greed. Has the world got any greed today? I tell you, greed's been around for a long, long, long time. Let's, let's begin in verse 16. Uh, I know Gabriel, I didn't give it to Gabriel, but you read there in your Bible, and it says this. It says, and it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us. 
which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And here's what it was. She had a spirit in her, and she was, she was a fortune teller. She was a fortune teller, and her master was using her to tell fortunes to gain money. People were paying her. Does this sound like anything today? Dial 1-800, I will give you your horoscope. I say horror, H-O-R-R-O-R, horoscope. 17, the same, uh, y'all ever, y'all ever had those people, it was like a gnat. In the South, we understand a gnat. That thing would get around your head. I was in the car, I was there, and a mosquito was in there, and I chased that thing for 15 minutes in my car. Every time it'd fly by, I'd, and I never could catch it. I never could catch it. And I, I was, I think Tracy thought I was crazy at first, because I was just over there clapping my hands. Like this. And then she said, oh, I see it now. Uh, and finally, I let the window down there to get out. You ever had those people with like a gnat? They just, they just bother you? They're not just, I mean, they just, they get on your last nerve. I, I, I'm just being real. I'm just being, there are people out there that just in their life, and, and they just keep on, and they keep on, and they keep on, and then you're like, have you ever said this? I wish they'd go home. Or have you, have you, ever, have you ever said this? I wish they'd hush. I just wish they would hush. You know, Paul found a person like that. Paul found like, look, look at verse 17. The same followed Paul, this damsel, this, this one that was uh, uh, soothsaying, the one that was uh, you know, predicting future. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servant of the Most High God who showed unto us the way of salvation. That's not a bad thing to say, but she just kept on. Everywhere they went, was, she was following, right? Verse 18. And this, listen to this, and this did she many days. She would not go away. This she did many days. Look at this. I like Paul finally got to the point where I, you know what, I think I've had enough. Verse 18. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. You understand what the Spirit was doing? It was really, was really kind of mocking Paul. Ah, he's going around telling us all how to be saved. That's the Spirit in this lady. He's going around telling everybody how to be saved in a mocking fashion. And Paul finally had it up to here, and he turned around and said, Spirit, come out of her. And bam, the Spirit came out. Now, that's a good thing, right? Unless you're gaining money off of her. Unless you're making money off of the things that she is doing. Verse 19. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains. The hope of their gains were gone. They called Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. And brought them to the magistrate saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And teach customs which is not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitudes rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had, verse 23, laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging, here it is, charging the jailer, this is why he wanted to kill himself when he thought they escaped, charging the jailer to keep them safely. He had one job, keep them safely. Isn't that crazy? Paul has cast out an evil spirit and because of that has been thrown into jail. So that sets the stage. That's where we are. That's how they got where they are. And so all of this begins by being arrested. By being arrested. That's uh, how this story begins. And so Paul exercises a spirit of divination from a slave girl. That's what she is. She's a slave because uh, the master is paying the way uh, or getting wages uh, or getting wages off of her. So she's nothing more than a slave to the master. Her master then, because he no longer has money. Do, do you see how the love of money is the root of all evil? Can you see how money drives it? Here is a man, Paul. What is he guilty of? What is he guilty of that would have him thrown in jail and all he's done is cast out an evil, cast out an evil spirit and now he's in jail because of that? All because of the love of money. All because, listen, and I'm telling you, we're in the world today and with the virus going around and all that we're seeing, I'm telling you, we see some things that are money driven. We see some things that have, have had big price increases. 
Uh, we've seen uh, uh, businesses because, and this is not a bad thing, uh, not bad in, in their sense, uh, they're going to lose their business because of the lack of money. Uh, we see how money can drive, listen, not only our homes, but our state, and it is world, it is worldwide. And so Paul and Silas now is in jail. They have been arrested for doing what we would call a good work. Now notice if the Philippian jailer and his household is now going to be saved. Isn't it amazing that God can take something, an event like this? You can see how God is preparing everything because that jailer, listen, if Paul is, here's the thing. Paul and Silas, if Paul and Silas doesn't go to jail, there's other prisoners there that haven't shared the gospel. Paul and Silas needed to be there because the jailer needed to hear. There's a, well, listen, they weren't the only ones there. It says that there were other prisoners in that place. And no one was singing other than Paul and Silas. No one was able to preach other than Paul and Silas. And so God's people, God's man, God's voice, uh, God had began to work all of this out behind the scenes. And, uh, and remember I told you, sometimes what seems like an uh-oh for us is an aha for God. When it seems like, oh, oh, I'm in trouble, it is an aha moment when God is working in our life. God is working ahead of us. So everything that happens sometimes that we think it's bad is not always bad. Again, it's all perspective and how you look at, as we looked this morning, how you look at the trials and the tribulations in your life to make sure that we look at it in the positive sense that God is working and God is doing things and our faith is growing through that. It's very easy. Paul and Silas could have very easily said, woe is us. They could have very easily said, you know what most of us said? It's not fair. And we all know, and we're old enough to know, and I used to have to teach this to my kids, life is not fair. I'm telling you, there was a lot of times my kids would say, well, Daddy, that's not fair. You know what I'd say? You're right, it's not. I didn't cater to them. I didn't crumble to them. Because the fact of the matter is, life is not fair. Nobody ever said that it was. And anybody that promised you that, that life is fair is lying to you. Because it's not fair. It's not fair. Some get more money than others. Some have, hey, is, is there people here that's got more money than you? I guarantee you it is. Life's not fair. They could have said life is not fair, but they didn't do that. And again, God is working behind the scene because just like the unit where there was one in the desert that God sent Philip to go preach to, there's a jailer that needs to hear him and his household. And so look at this. All the events leading up to the jailer's conversion. Let me tell you what Paul and Silas did. Again, I said, if we tried to have church at midnight, I don't know how many people would show up. I, I guess the good thing is that this guy had a job to do and he was going to be there. And God used that time. And that, uh, by the way, this shows a great thing that God uh, puts opportunity and times together for him to work. And, and sometimes it doesn't make sense. And I really believe, believe this, that God allows people's paths to cross for a reason. There's a reason. Again, I, I think how, how amazing it is that you and I, for whatever, listen, out of all the people in the world, well, let me, let me put it even closer to that. And this, I guess this is the bad side for y'all. Out of all the preachers in the world, you got me. <laughs> think about that. You see what I'm saying? Out of all the people in the world and all the places in the world, you and I get to worship together for some reason. Everybody that's in this church is imported to this church and to this place or God wouldn't have you here. Amen. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing to me that we get to spend this life together. Some of you are older than me. Some of you are a lot older than me. I don't want you to raise your hand. Some of you are younger than me. Well, I don't know if you are or not. And yet, oh, she's older than me too. I'm the young one here. And yet, listen, we get to spend life together. We get to spend time together. And here's the thing. God knew from the foundation of this earth that this day was going to happen. And that God had a plan and a purpose and a reason for this very day. That's why the Bible teaches us this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Because he's given us this day for a purpose, for a reason. He's seen fit for every one of us to make it to this day. 
to make it to this day. Now, some of y'all have had a lot of days you've made it to uh, coming up to this point. But the, the point is, is that, that God had the opportunity and the time and the purpose and the plan for all this to come together the same way he did for Philippian Jailer and Paul. Because Paul was arrested not for any crime. He really hasn't committed any crime at all other than keeping some ill-gotten money out of the pockets of some master, of a master who didn't like it. And so we find in all of that how God is working behind the scenes, making all of this take place. And so here, here's what Paul and Silas does. Instead of being, oh me, oh my, look at my situation, look at my circumstance, they are at midnight, I said almost or close to midnight, they are singing and praising God. Now that's kind of a strange place to be singing. It's kind of a strange place. Matter of fact, I want you to know they're doing this in the dark. Because the Bible says that when the, when, when the guy wakes up, he has to get light and come in to make sure all the prisoners are there. They're in the pitch dark, pitch black, and they're singing and praising God. Now, we got to have lights, and we got to have pianos, and we got to have books, and we got to have all kinds of things. I'm just telling you, in the roughness of their situation, instead of saying, oh me, oh my, they are singing praises to God because they're making a difference in the world. And they're singing and they're praising him, praising God at midnight. And check this out. Do you think anybody else could sleep that night? <laughs> Others? Let's go back and look at that. Let's go back and look in verse 25. It was at midnight. They were probably as loud as I am singing. I can imagine the echoing in that dark I don't believe anybody was saying, I wish those guys would shut up. No, look at, look at how it wrote in, in verse 25. I want you to see this. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. I believe they were praying out loud. You know why I know? And they were singing out loud. They weren't singing under, under the bread. They prayed and they sang praise unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Prisoners wasn't asleep, brother. Paul and Silas wasn't ashamed to pray. And Paul and Silas wasn't ashamed to sing. Now, I don't know. They may not could have carried a tune in a 12-handle bucket, but they were singing. And the prisoners heard. They were listening. Check this out. Check this out. And as they were praising God, there's a movement. None of the heart of man they sung and the place began to shake. They, I, I'm just telling you, I, I want to have a church service where the foundation of this church shakes. I'm not talking based on volume. I don't believe it was because it was based on volume. It was based on the movement of God. Amen. That place shook at the movement of God, at the power of God. So when we sometimes we talk about the power of God, here's what I want you to know. God, yes, can move mountains. And God can move prison cells. God can move buildings. And so we find there an earthquake shakes. And, and I tell you, it can't be a little shake. It's got to be a violent enough shake that two things happen. Prison doors are opened and chains fall off. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? I tell you, that's why the jailer couldn't sleep in that. It's amazing to me. The jailer, he may have been off in another room somewhere. It's amazing that the Bible says the jailer was asleep, but the other prisoners was listening to what was going on. I know this. I'd rather be the one listening when God is speaking and singing and praising than I had to be the one in the corner asleep somewhere. Amen. Notice this. The earthquake comes, it shakes, it loosens the door, and everyone, it said, everyone, not just Paul and Silas, let me tell you what, what the Bible says. What the Bible says. When, when I set you free, you are free indeed. And it wasn't just Paul and Silas that night, and I don't know how many prisoners was guilty, I don't know what their crimes was, but I'll tell you this, when God came that night and he shook the foundation, he set every prisoner free that night. Now, what that tells you and I is, those of us that have been prisoners of sin, those of us that have been prisoners of fear, no matter what our chain is that holds us, God is a God that sets us free. That's why Jesus said, when I set you free, you're free indeed. And so many people have things that change, that the chains that bind them, 
whether it's drugs or alcohol or, or a lifestyle. But I'm telling you, when God comes and He sets free, those chains fall off. And so we find then the same thing happened. That every one of them, everyone's chain for verse 26. Look at this. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. I, I, you talking about singing and shaking the rafters? You talking about praising God and shaking the rafters? You ever heard them old people say, man, uh, the rafter was ringing. An earthquake happened. God's power is unleashed so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately, I love that, immediately all the doors, not just one door, but it was all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. i am tell you, I want a church service like that where every person in here, bond, what they are bound by is set free. Amen. Can you imagine that church service? Maybe we need to have one at midnight and pray and sing. Every person now has been set free. So what happens? Because, of, and I've always said this, when God shows up most of the time, if God really shows up in power, what happens is it, most of the time it scares people to death. I know about church people would be scared. Church people, I tell you, if God showed up and the power and the majesty like we see like this, and we were in this place and the, and the foundation of this place shook, and we began to see people set free. I'm telling you, there would be people that would get up and run out of the door, scared to death about what was about to take place in here. I've always said this. If God's going to cast out the pigs, you better be right because them spirits got to go somewhere. Amen. Notice the fear that happened in the jailer. All the doors would open, verse 26, verse 27, and the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison door open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself. Why? Because the only job he had to do was make sure they was held uh, safe and when the first thing he saw was the doors opened. He knew his life was in danger. He knew that those that had put him in charge would come and kill him for losing all the prisoners that, that was there. Not only, listen, not only would he have lost Paul and Silas, but he was about to lose every prisoner that was in there. I don't know how many was in there. But could you imagine if there were 15 or 20, 30, and all 30 now have been set free? What would we say today if all of a sudden all the prisoners were turned loose? How would our lives be different? What would we say? But I love this fact. Remember how I said that, that Paul is more interested about relationship and relationship with people and, and relate, their relationship with God than really he was even of his own safety. And so Paul stops him. I like this verse 28. Paul cried out to him. Paul, Paul immediately cried out to him uh, and, 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 and in a loud voice. In a loud voice. He wanted to make sure the guy heard him. With a loud voice. And he, he said, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And so, I'm telling you, as Paul stopped him, this is what Paul, I want you to know what Paul was, Paul was reassuring him. Paul was giving him some reassurance. There are times in life when we all need reassurance. And so he reassured him that all the prisoners was present, everything was okay. And you know what this done? This called him to tremble. The fact that Paul and those would not run, that, 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 listen, something happened there. I can only imagine when, in his mind, you know how when you wake up sometimes and you can only just process a few things, and the first thing when he woke up, the first thing that he, he tried to process, seeing the gates was open, the doors was open, the first process in his mind, you know how you had sleep and you're trying to get your senses about you, was, oh no, the prisoners are gone. But when Paul reassured him that they were all there, and as he began to have time to process, something strange, something special has now happened because now he comes to the realization, oh, the doors are open. His first thing was, oh, the prisoners had escaped, but now, hey, wait a minute. Who opened the doors? What opened the doors? What caused all of this to happen? And trembling in this event... Trembling of what has happened now that goes beyond anything that he could explain, anything that he could understand. Listen, it automatically moved him to the point that he knew something greater than him, greater than Paul, greater than Silas had happened there. And it was only by a power of an almighty that would do something like that. Because after he processed it, the first thing that came out of his mouth after he had said, I was worried about the prisoners was, what must I do to be saved? What must, it forced him to ask the question. 
See, I've always said this. When you come to the realization that Jesus is who he is, God is who he is, then, then the question is this. What must I do with Jesus? That's what the world has got to ask. That's what the world has got to answer. If Jesus is who he says that he is, if God is who he says that he is, then the question that has to be answered is, what am I going to do about that? And those of us that answers that put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And those who don't want to answer that are left lost in this world. That's a, that's a plain fact. And so this guy comes and he says, what must I do to be saved? Now I like this. Paul says, don't do anything, do any harm. Verse 29, but then he called for a light. He called for a light. He wanted to go in and see. And when he saw the evidence, listen, he saw the evidence of doors open. He processed that. He saw the evidence of chains broken. He processed that. It, he comes now knowing that it's something greater than any man could do there. He comes trembling, verse 29. He sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, brought them out of that dark dungeon and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Because there's a power greater than anything he's ever seen before. Verse 31. As I told you, verse 30 is a simple, simple question that has great ramifications. What must I do to be saved? There's no simpler question than that. Listen, that doesn't get in a lot of theology, does it? There's not a lot of theology. There's not, he's not trying to dissect words. He's not breaking down. He's not doing hermeneutics and homiletics or any of that stuff. Right? He asked a simple question, trembling. What must I do to be saved? And the simple question got a simple answer. I love what Paul said. Verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. <clears throat> Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your house. That's the answer. But that's not where it stops. For the Bible tells us after that, because faith comes what? By hearing the word. Right? You want the evidence of that? Verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. Now, I don't know everything that he said. I don't know everything that was preached. It doesn't give us that. But it says, he spake unto them the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. The word of the Lord was preached. It's, it's that simple, folks. That's why when we, when we gather our children together, we've got to teach them the word. That's why I share with you this morning, knowledge is information. How do you get it? You get it by the word. Wisdom is how to rightly apply it. But in order to gain knowledge and have wisdom, you can't just go out there and say, God, give me wisdom, and never get in the Word and think that God's going to give you wisdom because knowledge comes by information. It comes by text. And therefore, that's why the Bible said that it comes, faith comes by hearing of the Word. Our knowledge is gained by the Word. And so they preached the Word to him, right? They, and, 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 and to, the, to his house. And in the same hour of that night, the jailer watches the stripes of Paul and Silas. Hey, his attitude toward mankind has changed. His attitude toward Paul and Silas now has changed. In so much so that now he washes the wounds where they have beaten him, beaten them and thrown them in prison. Now he has, listen, I'm telling you, Lord's compassion, when you see the compassion of God in your life, you want to share that same compassion with others. That's why he said, love God and love your neighbor. Because the love by where he has loved us is the same love that we ought to love one another. And you, we see it in this guy. He now cleans and washes the stripes of Paul and Silas, right? Uh, and, and matter of fact, he even brings Paul and Silas into his home. That's what the Bible said. Now, real quick, before I close, I just want to make a few observations when we close tonight. First of all, salvation requires faith. Bottom line. Amen. We can argue, we can discuss, we can talk, we can, uh, people can say there's all different kinds of ways. I'm telling you, everything that we've seen and every conversion that we've seen, it has all been the same way. It is faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Every one of them that we've looked at. 
And so my observation is this, is salvation requires faith. So, so it, it, listen, it is the natural thing to do. When somebody asks, what must I do to be saved? The automatic answer ought to be faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Him all. That's been in every single case. Without faith, without faith, one is not suitable or a subject for baptism. I'll say that again. I'm telling you, I'm not being mean, but I've had people that told me, well, I was baptized when I was a baby. Well, I'm telling you, that's not what the Bible says. Amen. I may get slapped for that, but I'm telling you, if you don't have faith, baptism's out of the picture. All right? Without faith, you're not a suitable subject for baptism. Having established the necessity of faith. Paul says it is by faith. Then he comes back and he speaks the word to them. He tells them it is by faith. Then he gives them the product, the word, that would lead them in faith. So how did you have faith? It is in the word. It is not man-made. Faith is not man-made. It's not something you can conjure up. It is not something that you can just on a whim say, well, I have faith. It comes by the hearing of the word. Period. We see it in this. So he establishes the necessity of faith and then he speaks the word of the Lord to, to him and to all of the house. Faith comes by hearing. Now I know he doesn't say here, but in every other case we've seen, what comes after hearing of the word? Repentance. You must repent. I'm telling you this because you and I, if listen, if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ by hearing of the word, I hope and pray you know the day you heard the word and the word became real and the word became life to you and you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and you put your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You weren't saved because mama wanted you saved. You're not saved because daddy wanted you saved. You're not saved because the preacher wanted you saved or told you that you were saved. You're saved because of the word of God penetrated your heart and you believe in Jesus Christ. Faith come by the word and that, and that action in you was that you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you've done that, you're saved. That's when salvation happens. Now, I understand that there's those, and I don't want to get, I know I'm on, out, out in, 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 on the big earth today, tonight, with all this going on. But, but listen, I know there are those that say, well, when it talks about a whole household, then there, there had to be infants that was there. It didn't say that. Matter of fact, here's my thing. If, if faith comes by hearing, then wouldn't you have to agree you have to understand it? The word. Will you tell me how a baby understands the word? I'll just leave it right there. I could go further with it. But if faith comes by hearing of the word and the understanding of the word so that it moves us, so that it, it motivates us, so that faith comes by hearing of the word and understanding the word, you tell me how an infant can understand the word. But some say, well, it's the household. It doesn't say because the household. It doesn't tell me in here that there was one baby in that household. I, I will venture to say that they have to be old enough to understand. He was preaching the word. He, listen, he wasn't preaching to infants. He was preaching to those who would understand. That's what, uh, uh, listen, that, that we could come to that conclusion. Paul spoke the word of the Lord to all who were in the house, implying that all were able to listen and to understand what was being said. If you don't understand what's being said in the Word, how can you follow it? You've got to be able to understand it. You see? The jailer rejoiced. I love this. Let's let, let, look at verse 32. And they, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and he washed their stripes and what? And they were baptized. He and all straightway. Faith came and then they were baptized. Faith came and then they were baptized. Right? Who... Who? Faith came by who? Those who heard the word. Those who understood the word. Verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house, I love this, and set meat before them, listen to this, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. They believed. It was because of belief. 
because of belief. So, with the conversion of the two households at, 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 at Philippi, we find Lydia, we find, we find the Philippian jail here. As I share with you, the church at Philippi began to, be, uh, began to become a congregation. And, and, and so then that congregation led to support the Apostle Paul and the preaching of the gospel throughout Macedonia, a, a congregation that was mindful. From this conversion of Lydia and from this conversion of the Philippian Jehovah. There was this congregation that was mindful of Paul. Even toward the end of his life, we find there was so much love for Paul and what was established in these and, and those listen that, that believed in what Paul was preaching and Paul was teaching. They, they supported him even toward the end of his life as he awaited trial in Rome. Listen, never underestimate the effect of the gospel in the life of a family and what that family will do in a church for generations. For generations. And so the foundation was set for a church that was birthed in a prison by two men who were willing to pray and sing at midnight. And a church was started at Philippi. The Philippians who supported Paul and his, his ministry and became a thriving church. Let me ask you this. What if we just really got real with God and we sung and we praised Him and we allowed God to use us the way He used Paul and Silas? What would the impact of our church make on the world that we're in? Because two people in prison talked to a Philippian jailer about Jesus Christ and a church was birthed that done mighty, mighty works throughout the land. What about us? Do we take for granted the times that we're together? That God has put us in this place to work together in this place to be the church at Lowry Town Baptist Church. This is our Philippian jail hour. This is our time. This is our people. This is our moment that God has put us here to be the church that he's called us to be. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and the opportunity that we could share tonight.